all sorts of drama as to whether or not President Joe Biden should stay in this race. Now, you've seen polling from from uh, different sources talking about how black voters feel about uh, Biden in response to the debate. But they're not talking to just black people. Uh, joining us right now is Adrian Shropshire, executive director of Black Pack. They have the new poll out, uh, which shows exactly how African-Americans, what they think about President Biden after the debate performance. Uh, so glad to have Adrian here. And so, Adrian, again, it's driving me crazy seeing these polls and seeing them talk about black people from the New York Times poll or YouGov and others. Well, there's a very small sample of black folks. Talk about the poll that y'all just released. Yeah, so we had a, a poll in the field when the debate happened. Um, and we were trying to do in that poll what we're always trying to do, you know, get the snapshot of where black voters are at any given moment throughout the cycle. Um, and so the the data that we released, and we actually have more data to release, we, we wanted to get this information out because it felt like it was important for the, the, the debate that was happening in the country. Um, the data that we released shows, one, the kind of steady progress um, that the president's campaign has been making with black voters. And so one is that, you know, so the, the one piece of information is that from our last poll in February to the poll in June, the president was actually increasing his support numbers among black folks. Um, that's important because it means that the work that they've been doing to, to make sure that they're breaking through with black voters it was actually at working. Um, the second piece of data that we released essentially says that for black voters who watch the debate, their support numbers for the president increased, right? So they watched the debate. They saw it with their own eyes. They saw two things on the debate stage. One, they saw Joe Biden give a very poor performance that I don't think anyone disagrees with. But they also saw a liar um, who stood on the stage and lied for 90 minutes. Um, and they made a choice about which of those two candidates um, that they understood who they were before they watched the debate. But after the debate, increase their support for Biden. For those people who didn't watch the debate, um, we saw a, the, the opposite effect, which means that their understanding, people who did not watch the debate, their understanding of the debate uh, was influenced by the post-debate narrative. Um, and they didn't have the same level of support, uh, in increase in support for Joe Biden. And so that's important because it says that people are making decisions um, based on what they're seeing uh, in their social media feeds or the sort of narrative that, e that is emerging around what has happened that is isn't exactly, I think, what people who saw the debate saw, right, with, with their own eyes. So um, that, that feels important, right, in terms of um, how impactful the, the things that people say about what is happening or how people interpret what's happening in the, in the race has real implications for um, the way that the base sees what's happening. So, Adrian, when, when looking at, again, your, your polling, so what we're seeing is that all the trepidation about Biden, his age, that we've seen since last year, closer you get to the election, folks go from... Mm, I don't know to, yo, now I got to lock in. One of the things all I heard today was Project 2025. Yes. Mm -hmm. I wasn't at Essence, but I got reports from people as well. Yeah. And so what's interesting to me is that while these Democrats on Capitol Hill uh, are trying to, frankly, dump Biden, you have the base that's saying, this is a clear and present threat that could very well change this election if they don't change the top of their ticket. Yeah, so I feel like there is, I mean, I'm an organizer um, at, at heart. And so I'm always really clear that the thing that I don't ever want to do is get out in front of um, the base. Um, and I think that what you just said is very accurate. And we've seen this too. I mean, obviously you've seen the, the, um, the searches for Project 2025 go up. I mean, Taraji P. Henson uh, did everyone a, a solid uh, when she stood on the stage and said, Project 2025 is dangerous to us, go look it up. Um, because I think that people are uh, zoning in, right? People uh, people understand and understood before. I don't, you know, I think that, that um, black folks and the voters that we've talked to, whether it's in our focus groups um, or on the doors, right, where we're knocking doors in battleground states are really clear about what the stakes are. I think that 2025, uh, 
uh, the Project 2025 and as people are you know, looking it up and trying to understand what it is and the implications that it has, not just for the country, but for black people specifically, um, it only clarifies more um, how um, how much danger right we are in um, as a nation it 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 makes the stark uh, contrast and stark relief uh, about the existential st- threat that Donald Trump um, poses and that the Republican Party um, which is uh, you know adopting uh, 2025 whether they you know are trying to distance themselves for, from it or not you can look at what the Republican Party just put out as their national platform in 2025 and see where the overlap is right and so you know I think that as as that becomes as those data points become clear as people see and hear Donald Trump as they have been the entire time and the kind of unhinged um, you know rhetoric that he has on his um, uh, rallies, what the things that he said, you know, at the debate, sort of doubling down on racism, right, at, right there on the debate stage, talking about the types of jobs that Black people deserve, talking about immigrants, um, you know, people, people know what's at stake, um, and they're they're clear that we need to that we need to be on the side of democracy and saving this democracy as we have always done. But people are also really clear that we need to get the House in order in order to get about that business. Um, of making sure that Donald Trump doesn't see the inside of the White House again. Um, Adrian, I'm going to ask you another question before I um, got questions from Robert and the rest of the panel. Uh, and, and then that is, we are now in uncharted territory. Um, you talk about being an organizer. You see what's happening on Capitol Hill. This is being driven by the party elites, these top donors. Uh, I talked to some prominent Democrats uh, before I came onto the show. Congressional Black Caucus has been locked, a strong lock, strong and locked, saying you stick with Biden Harris. As an organizer, if these donors, and we saw what Nancy Pelosi did today on the morning show, if they are successful in leaning on Biden, to drop out. All the things that you talked about completely shut down. All the forward progress because now for the next month until the convention, you don't know what the hell is going to happen. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think Pelosi clarified her comments um, when she got back to her office and said that she thought that the the New York Times in particular had misinterpreted what she said. Um, But I I do think that there is, you know, I do worry about, um, you know, there being not enough attention paid um, to what is actually happening on the ground. Um, And I know that folks are saying that they're looking at polls, et cetera. But I also know what we're hearing um, as we're knocking on doors. And it just doesn't it just doesn't comport. Um, and so I'm concerned about about the base, because I think that in some ways this is not just um, a potential problem for this election. I think that it has the long, you know, the potential of having long term damage within the within the Democratic Party um, if the base feels like it is being disrespected. And we have to remember that there was a primary process and people voted and they voted overwhelmingly for Joe Biden. And I think, you know, it is it is critical to not just simply dismiss um, the will of the people from the process that they understood to be the process that was going to get the nom- uh, determine who the nominee was. And so I just think that there are some, you know, uh, like folks need to be careful uh, about what they're doing right now. And, and particularly given the, the conversation from the uh, the last the last part of the discussion um, about, you know, um, the vice president and the sort of early, you know, um, uh, sort of rhetoric that we were hearing when um, people first started calling for the president to step aside with the notion that someone would replace him other than the vice president. And obviously that has uh, toned down um, and that, you know, you have folks now coming out and saying, of course, I would support, you know, the vice president if she was the nominee. But I think that even the, the, the mere suggestion that that the, the sitting black vice president of the United States would be jumped over um, already has, you know, potential to to create, um, you know, disunity. Um, and I think that that disunity is, you know, not necessarily just in the short term, but can do long term damage to the Democratic coalition. Robert? for uh, joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, I want to go straight to Scott Bolden uh, for questions and the rest of the panel. Scott? Yeah, uh, thank you for being on. So when you're in the field, uh, uh, when you're in the field, so you're saying that 
the black vo black voters in this country are still behind Biden, notwithstanding that performance, still anti-Trump, and that the Democratic Party needs to stay the course and stop talking about getting rid of Joe Biden. I, I think I'm right about that, right? Well, what we haven't seen is any is any noticeable change in our conversation, right? So we haven't seen, you know, the, when we're asking folks, you know, what their top issues are, when we're asking them what their their vote uh, choices are going to be, um, we haven't right. seen the last two weeks any big change in that. Voters are still saying that they support, um, you know, the majority support Biden. We see very little support for Donald Trump. We do see some support for third party candidates, which again is something that you know needs to be taken um, into consideration in terms of strategy. So I think we, we are seeing um, steady responses uh, from the black voters that we are talking to in, in battleground states. What I'm saying is that the those who are in this conversation about how this nominating process is going to turn out um, really need to um, to prioritize. Uh, what what voters are saying. And obviously, you know, black voters are a part of the Democratic coalition, um, but a significant part of the Democratic coalition and significant part of the coalition that's going to that is going to, you know, uh, elect any president um, to to office. And so um, that attention needs to be paid to what folks are saying and where folks are. And I think that if they if we're not seeing significant, you know, uh, abandonment, then, you know, this the question of who should be the nominee, particularly that we given the fact that there has been a process. And if you can't explain a way to people yeah. how they voted for someone and then the the nominee is going to change, like you have to you have to bring people along in whatever process yeah. you think you're leading. I, I, I got you. But but couple couple of things. One, were, did you poll on whether they wanted Kamala Harris to replace Biden? And two, two weeks in the field was pretty close to right after the debate. From, a, from your expertise, is that too soon to get in the field to get reliable results? Well, we I mean, when I'm saying in the field, I'm talking about our, our literal door knocking, right? So not necessarily, uh -huh. not necessarily our polling. And we've been knocking on doors for months now. <laughs> so what I'm comparing the sort of post-debate responses from voters about support for, for Biden, those responses post-debate aren't any different than the than the responses that we that we saw two months ago or three months ago. That's okay. that's all I'm saying in terms of that. So um, but, I, you know, I think that um, that if voters are consistently saying that this is the candidate they're going to support, then it, then that's what they mean. Um, we did not and have not asked um, whether or not, um, you know, voters were support com uh, the, the vice president um, as the nominee, um, partly because, you know, again, we when in our poll, we were in the field right when it with the poll, when it when it when uh, when the debate happened, um, and there, you know, there was not a conversation in right. that moment about right. who might come out um, on the other end. And, and also, as far as I'm concerned right now, Joe Biden is actually still the nominee. So for the moment, we're still asking questions about him until that changes. Otherwise, we're engaging in a hypothetical that has not emerged. And I, I don't, I don't want to be a part of confusing voters any more than they already are. Yeah. Thank you. Have a question. Do I get to ask another one? <laughs> well, let's go to Rebecca. Let's go to Rebecca. You know, I got plenty of questions, man. <laughs> <laughs> we know, Scott. We know. Rebecca, go ahead. It's my turn now, Scott. Um, so, Adrian, um, in 1984, the party elites understood that Ronald Reagan wasn't competent for a second term. Um, however, Ronald Reagan was reelected, and we now know through history that Ronald Reagan largely did not run his second term. Someone else was in charge. So should we be asking voters, and particularly Black voters, whether or not um, Black voters feel or think that Joe Biden is competent to serve a second term? Well, I mean, I think all those questions are completely legitimate to be asking voters. Um, you know, I think that, um, you know, if there, there is a debate that's that is raging. Right. And I don't think that we want to leave voters out of that out of that debate. If there are questions that are being asked, then we should be asking everybody. Right. Who's going to be a part of the process to make this to make this determination. So I think it's totally legitimate to be asking um, uh, voters that right now. 
But I think that we have to accept their answers, right? Either, either way that they go. If, if, vote, if black voters say, yes, I think Joe Biden is old because y'all been telling us he's old for two years, and yeah, he's a little slow on the uptake, but I'm sticking with him, then that's what they're saying, right? If they yeah. say, yeah, no, I don't know, I was taken aback, and I'm not sure if he should be the one, then we should take that into consideration as well. But I, I don't think that folks should be making assumptions about where people are and arriving at conclusions because we want voters to be someplace that they are not. All right, now, Joy, do you have a question? Yes. And the other question, I mean, I have for you is, I, I totally agree with you, Adrian. And I mean, the other question is, you know, who are they going to vote for? Because people can think all kinds of things, but ultimately they're like, hey, this is who I'm still planning to vote for because the issues are beyond how I feel about him, how I feel about her, how I feel about, you know, a multiple people. Um, and then the, the other question is beyond Kamala Harris, who else do people have emerged as someone who they would want? Is there some name that's been floating out there that people are excited about? Because I'm going to be honest, I haven't heard it. I've only heard Joe Biden and I've only heard Kamala Harris and I'm inclined to believe them. I, you know, I don't, uh, we certainly haven't heard anyone raise any other, uh, any other potentials. And I also just think that, you know, um, when we think about, we, you know, if, if this is the work that you do, right, then you understand that there's a deep democratic bench, right? And names have emerged and we've all seen them. I'm not sure that voters at large, and that, and that includes black voters, know much about any of these folks, right? And so when we talk about the time that we have to get to the, to the, um, to the, uh, convention, um, I'm not sure that there's time to actually inform, right? Like bring people along, keep, you know, a, about uh, a candidate that they have never heard of or don't know much about. I mean, I think that the reality is that, you know, to, to your, your first part of your, um, of your question is that, um, People know what's at stake. They understand the danger that we face as a country, as a nation, um, and as a community, right? People understand that, and they are going to mobilize around that point. I mean, I think we can't say enough that the threat is existential. It is a choice between an America that maintains a democracy, that gives us a fighting chance to have a more perfect union, right? That gives us a fighting chance to have a multiracial democracy that is grounded in justice, right? Like, that gives us a chance at that. Um, or in America that literally crashes out and goes with dictatorship and authoritarianism. And I think that that, like, that is the choice and people understand that. And so when given that choice, people, I believe um, that not only us, right, not only our community, right, will do what needs to be done and show up in the way we need to show up. But I also think that, you know, that ultimately uh, Americans will as well, right? Like this, the, the clarity, you know, is, is before us. Um, and so I think that that's true. I worry about the conversation and the debate that's happening and the sort of chaos that it feels Feels like it's happening in the in the Democratic Party. Um, I worry about it leading to a sense um, of defeatism, right? That it that it leads to um, you know a sense among the base and among voters in general, the Democratic base and voters in general, um, that that all is lost, right? That things cannot be done, and you see the chaos, and what does it even matter anymore? And so that's what I worry about: a prolonged uh, in fight, right, among the Democratic Party. And it's not just the Democratic Party, to be clear, right? There are folks who, who ain't never been a Democrat, <laughs> right, who are in on this conversation, right? They want to say, right. they don't have a vote, right, because they are not delegates, um, but they want something to say. And so my worry is that a prolonged internal fight actually begins to just depress the vote. And, and, I think and that's all the right. Mm -hmm. I want to get and, back and, in there, too. <laughs> and, and on that point, uh, we, we keep hearing this uh, idea that there's 20-something percent of black men that are going to vote for Trump, um, nearly double the number of black women they're saying in some polls say they're going to support to Trump. Uh, are you seeing that reflected in your polls? And then after that, we're going to go back to Roland. No, not at all. Not in any poll that we have ever done. Um, not in any focus group that we have ever conducted. And not on the doors as we are talking um, to voters. Um, it just, it just, you know, 
people may say different things in polls, right? When people call them. Um, but when, when you sample, when you're having conversations, you're doing polling with a large sample size of black voters, that doesn't emerge. We've seen the, the, the level of support for Trump be very consistent um, with the actual turnout support during elections, right? 16, 20, right? During the midterms for other Republicans, we see that level of support, um, you know, remain consistent. It's under 10%. And so, um, you know, seven, eight, nine percent, maybe. Right. And so I think that um, we haven't seen it again, not in our polls, not in our focus groups and not as we're talking to voters at their doors in battleground states. No, absolutely. We're going to throw it back to well, Roland. And, that's one Roland. The, and yeah, and that's one of the reasons why I want to make sure that we had you on here, Adrian. Uh, you know, look, mainstream media, they're, they're not talking to y'all. Again, y'all are polling, you know, a significant number of black people, way more than the rest of these polls. In fact, I was on Twitter earlier uh, and Matthew Dowd uh, was quoting uh, black people. How they feel about Biden for the New York Times poll. And I said, Matthew, if you're going to quote black folks, quote the black pack poll. Don't sit here and quote the small sample in the New York Times poll. But again, that's the problem that we continue to face. Adrian, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you so much. Fan base exclusive audio rooms are here. Now tap, talk, and get paid. Monetize your live podcast and most engaging conversations. You can now create exclusive audio chat rooms only for your subscribers and biggest fans. And as a user, subscribe, listen, and talk to your favorite creators. Now tap, talk, and get paid. Because everyone's a fan of something, and everyone has a fan base. And if you don't know...